Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The first visit by British Foreign Minister to Moscow for five years has ended in public disagreement, with Russia accusing the UK of fabricating allegations against it. Boris Johnson's visit was intended to try to repair what both sides acknowledge is a low point in relations between the two countries. Mr Johnson accused Russia of meddling in the UK election and Brexit referendum. The Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, said Mr Johnson was making that up and criticised the UK for making what he called a series of aggressive and insulting public statements about Russia. Our diplomatic correspondent, James Robbins, reports from Moscow. Handshakes can be deceptive. True, this Foreign Secretary has broken a five-year British boycott of visits to Moscow but when Russia's Sergei Lavrov says he wants a return to business as usual, Boris Johnson says that's impossible. Uh, as you rightly say, Sergei, uh, things are not easy uh, between us at the moment. The talks aired the grievances on both sides and examined space for limited cooperation by supporting the Iran nuclear deal together and opposing the nuclear threat from North Korea. But deep disagreements remain. At their joint news conference, that was stark. For all the efforts at banter, there was a seriousness when Sergei Lavrov tried to brush off British allegations of Russia meddling in foreign elections. My neighbour, Boris Johnson, recently stated he had no evidence that Russia meddled in the referendum on the withdrawal of Britain from the European Union. Not successfully. Not successfully, I think, is the word. Not successfully is the word that uh, I think you need to introduce. You see, he's scared if he doesn't disagree with me, his reputation will be ruined in the media at home. I, 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 Sergei, it's your reputation I'm worried about. <laughs> but this was dark, serious humour. And when Boris Johnson was asked if he trusted Russia's foreign minister, he tried to make light of that. You know, it's a measure of my, of my trust... Uh, that as soon as I got into this uh, excellent uh, foreign minister, I immediately handed my coat, my hat, my gloves, uh, and indeed everything that was in my pocket, secret or otherwise, to Sergei Lavrov. I can say there was nothing in the pockets of Boris's coat. So how did relations with Russia go from bad to worse? Russia's use of radioactive poison to murder Alexander Litvinenko in the middle of London started the slide. Three years ago, Russia's annexation of Crimea and interference in Ukraine provoked tough EU sanctions strongly backed by Britain. Then last month, Theresa May accused Russia of cyber espionage and meddling in elections. Britain says it has cyber weaponry to retaliate if attacks get worse. So, striding across Red Square, the Foreign Secretary was no mere tourist. He was nodding to Russia's historic greatness while pressing for a radical change of direction. Coming here to Red Square, Boris Johnson insists that he loves Russia. He points to his name, the fact that he has some Russian ancestry. What he doesn't love is the present Russian government. So, paying his tribute at the tomb of Russia's unknown soldier had a particular symbolism. Britain and Russia fought together against Hitler as allies. Restoring that closeness now seems a long way off. Well, James, it was pretty tense at the press conference today between Boris Johnson and Sergei Lavrov. The whole point of this meeting was to improve relations. Do you think it has? There certainly seems to be no breakthrough, but this was a very important meeting. I mean, these are two big players in very different ways. This country, Russia, is by far the largest in the world by land area. Britain, of course, is relatively tiny, but has a far larger economy than Russia's. Both make up together two of only five veto powers at the Security Council, they really do have to get along much better if they are to help to improve global security. There were real tensions uh, in the meeting and at the press conference. There are huge differences. Russia talking about a construct of Western lies designed to do Russia down. Boris Johnson saying he's no cold warrior, but coming here determined to stand up for 
some socially liberal values. He very deliberately championed, for instance, the rights of the LGBT community while he was here. He mentioned that in Sergei Lavrov's presence. And he also very deliberately laid flowers at the spot where opposition leader Boris Nemtsov was assassinated under the Kremlin walls two years ago. So some very strong messaging from both sides. No breakthrough, I think. James in Moscow, thank you. It was what diplomats might describe as frank. Boris Johnson, the first British Foreign Secretary to visit Moscow for five years, met his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, calling for better relations between the two countries. Just yesterday, he compared Russia to Sparta, describing it as closed, nasty, militaristic and anti-democratic. And today's talk swiftly descended into sparring about alleged Russian meddling in the Brexit referendum, as our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, now reports. There was a time when Britain and Russia were allies, fighting Hitler together. The foreign secretary, who laid a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Moscow today, was clear that relations are now at a low ebb. That was why he went. We can't ignore those difficulties. We can't pretend that they uh, do not exist. We hear some aggressive statements from London, from the media, from the TV, and from the leadership of the United Kingdom, from some officials. Despite all that, we have never taken any aggressive measures to reciprocate. Alleged Russian cyber attacks on Western democracies were top of the British agenda, leading to a prickly exchange. My neighbor, Mr. Johnson, has recently said that he has no evidence that Russia interfered in the UK referendum. Not successfully is the word that uh, I think you need to use. You see, here's a phrase that if he doesn't contradict me, then when he gets back to the UK, his reputation is going to be ruined I, I, in the media. I, 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 Sergei, it's your reputation I'm worried about. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's very, very important that uh, you, know, you, sh you should recognize that uh, Russian attempts to uh, interfere in, in our elections and our uh, reference, whatever they may have been, have not been successful. So you can reassure yourself on, on that point. Relations cooled when former Russian spy Alexander Litvinenko was poisoned in London in 2006. A British investigation concluded that he was likely killed by a Russian intelligence agent. Syria is another point of tension. Russian bombers continue to target rubble-held areas, blaming Britain and other Western countries for the rise of jihadists. Today, President Putin was rewarding Russian troops who fought in Syria. I want to thank the entire staff of the Russian Armed Forces. In the fight with international terrorism, this global threat, our soldiers and officers acted courageously, professionally, and what's very important, efficiently. The Foreign Secretary laid flowers at the spot where opposition politician Boris Nemtsov was murdered. Some Russian politicians might say the gesture was interfering in their politics. But the Russian government didn't stop him making it. The Christmas lights have been turned on in Red Square. This year's theme is theatre. Today, the diplomats let their masks slip to reveal the animosity beneath. A little discord in the season of goodwill. Lindsay Hilson reporting. Well, earlier I spoke to Andrei Kortinov, the Director General for the Russian International Affairs Council and an advisor to the Russian Foreign Ministry, and Ben Nimmer, an information defense fellow for the Atlantic Council think tank. I began by asking Ben Nimmer what evidence there is of Russian interference in electoral processes in the West. The strongest evidence we have is from the United States in the election campaign last year. And there we have a whistleblower from what's called the Troll Factory, so a, an organization in St. Petersburg which run fake social media accounts, confirming that they were running accounts targeting the US election. What we've seen in the UK is anonymous accounts, which do not give any indication of where they're from, behaving in exactly the same way and forming part of the same community, interacting with known troll factory accounts. So the evidence for what's been going on in the US is extremely solid. 
the evidence for what we have in the UK is less complete at the moment, and that's what's being looked into at the moment. Uh, Andrzej Kochanov, uh, what's your reaction to that? I mean, you heard it there from Ben Nemo. He's an expert on this subject. He's looked at the expert evidence, and clearly the finger is being pointed at Russia. Well, I think that it is easy to imagine that uh, there are some hackers uh, in Russia or elsewhere uh, who feel that uh, for this or that reason they would like to make a difference uh, in the Western public opinion. Uh, I can imagine that uh, they were trying to influence the outcome of the U.S. elections. However, I find it very difficult to believe uh, these people were instructed by Mr. Putin or the Kremlin uh, to do what they were doing. Uh, ben I mean, he's got a point there, hasn't he? What is the evidence that links these troll factories and this sort of interference to the Russian government? There are various pieces of evidence, and particularly if you look at the way the troll factory interacts with, let's say, official Russian government accounts, such as some of the Russian embassy Twitter feeds, such as Russia Today TV and Sputnik, there is an absolute interlock between their activities. The, the work of the Troll Factory was entirely consistent with the work of all the other parts of what we know are Kremlin-funded propaganda outlets. OK, your reaction to that, Andrei Kortinov? And again, I cannot ex exclude uh, that uh, some people, volunteers, uh, would like to be helpful uh, to the Kremlin, and, and they believe that that would uh, be appreciated or even rewarded by the Russian authorities. And they did what they did. But however, you know, let me also emphasize that the overall impact uh, of uh, this interference was uh, very limited. If mm. you look at the whole scale of the social media uh, in the United States, it was clearly a drop in the bucket. But if, if, if they're so ineffective, if the overall impact is so limited, why does the Kremlin bother? Because it's just giving your country a bad reputation. There's a political price to pay for it for not very good results. Well, my personal take is that this whole issue was grossly underestimated uh, uh, by the Kremlin in terms of its sensitivity uh, to Western societies. And uh, if uh, you follow the Russian reaction, uh, including the reaction from Mr. Putin, it was pretty dismissive. Basically, Putin argued that uh, it's not a big deal and uh, you should be grateful to some of these trolls uh, who might have exposed uh, the wrongdoings mm. of the national speech of the Democratic Party. But uh, in my opinion, if I were to speculate about uh, the motivations, I think that uh, there might have been a message to the West uh, that uh, basically if you live in the house of glass, you shouldn't throw stones at the windows of uh, your neighbors. Because the perception in Moscow, at least in the Kremlin, is that the West and the United States in particular uh, has uh, consistently interfered uh, into the Russian political process starting from uh, early 1990s. Ben Nero, if the, this form of interference is as ineffective as it seems to be, and I guess it's hard to quantify, um, why do you think the Russians have been bothering with it? What's the mentality behind that? Bear in mind that President Putin is facing re-election in March next year. His re-election in 2012 was marred by heavy-handed vote rigging, a lot of demonstrations, and quite a lot of discontent in the mm. Russian population. And I would suspect that he is desperate to avoid a rerun of the 2012 embarrassment. And so I think what we're going to see in the next few months is much more Russian propaganda trying mm. to undermine the concept of Western democracy and trying to undermine the concept of free and fair elections. because. Putin has an election not just to win, but he needs right. to win it gloriously. Now, Boris Johnson has apparently said to his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, who we met uh, today, that if this sort of cyber interference continues, then GCHQ is ready to retaliate and there would be serious you know, measures coming from the UK. Is he bluffing or do we actually have these means to retaliate? According to the reporting I've seen this week, GCHQ have been developing their retaliatory capability. Now that, I'm assuming, would not be on the social media side. Mm. I don't think we're going to see a, a GCHQ Twitter account suddenly starting to <laughs> troll Russia. That would be much more on the, on the hard cyber side. But it's an effective tool if they wish to deploy it. More and more societies go online more and more. So, so in general, yes, cyber mm. is an effective tool. Whether it's an effective deterrent, whether there will be the political decision taken to use it, that, that, those are imponderables. Right. Andrei Kortinov, on a previous occasion when relations between Moscow and London weren't all that rosy, uh, Dmitry Peskov, who's you know, Putin's main spokesman, called Britain a small island that no one is paying attention to. Is that still the case? 
I think it is clearly an overstatement. And I think that uh, the importance that was attached uh, to the uh, visit of uh, Secretary Johnson to Malta suggests that uh, they uh, do respect the United Kingdom and they consider it to be an important player. The United Kingdom, among other things, is a prominent member of the United Nations Security Council, so it shares responsibility mm -hmm. with Russia and other prominent members on issues like Syria, uh, North Korea, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, and many others. Andre Kortenov, Ben Nemo, thank you very much indeed.